So it is said that there's three types of people in this world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. <laughs> Let me say this again. There's three types of people in this world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who just plain wonder what happened. <laughs> and I want to tell you that the difference between the people who make things happen and the people who watch things happen is very simple. Because the person who makes things happen simply has good habits. They have habits of a successful person. They have a winning attitude. They have really good habits. When they wake up every single morning, they established good habits. They established a way of life that leads them to their destiny. And tonight, I want to talk to you about your destiny. I want to talk to you about something that each and every single one of us that we can relate here with because, I mean, I don't plan on dying tomorrow. I might, but I don't plan on that. I plan on living for a long time, and I plan on doing something great in this life. And I know that you do too. Because as a Christian, like I said before, we have vision. We're going somewhere. We have something to look forward to. And if we're going to make it, if we're going to reach that destiny, we have to have good habits. Something that's going to hold us up when times get a little bit rough. Something that's going to hold us up when the wind and the waves come and we don't know what else to do. Because the devil will try to stop you from reaching your destiny. You know, I said we have a mega, mega vision. And you know what? That means we're going to have mega, mega opposition. Am I right? Do you agree? Have any of you guys experienced some mega, mega opposition in your life? I'm raising my hand. I'm going to raise my hand twice because that's me. When things in life don't go the way that you expected, you're, you're on the track, you're on the right track, and boom, roadblock comes. And all of a sudden, everything in your life is shaken. Everything in your life is, is twisted around. But what makes a person successful in life, what makes a person able to make it, to be the one to make things happen, is their habits. Because the decisions that you make today affect your future tomorrow. The choices that you make today will determine your tomorrow. So you can decide today whether you're going to wake up or whether you're going to sleep. You can decide today whether you're going to work hard or whether you're going to be lazy, whether you're going to read your Bible or whether you're going to wait for a more convenient time. We face those decisions every single day. And if we're going to make it in life, if we're going to reach our destiny, we have to reach a point in our life where we're making good decisions daily so that we can focus on the prize, focus on what God has before us. So like I said, your daily decisions determine the outcome of your future. And the man of God, Prophet T.B. Joshua, said that this year, 2014, is the year of crossing the bridge. The year of crossing the bridge to your destiny. So I'm going to say that again. This year, you will cross the bridge to your destiny. Do you believe that? Amen. We believe it. You know, it's easy to think when you have a big task in front of you, like what we have with our mega, mega vision. How on earth are we going to cross that bridge? How on earth are we going to pack this place, pack it so much that there's not enough room that we have to get a bigger building? How are we going to do that this year? Well, I'm telling you the way that we're going to do it is this. We're going to have some really good habits if you look at many of the characters in the Bible who made it in life, they simply had good habits. And I'm talking about making the decision to wake up and to read your Bible. The Word of God is so powerful. In fact, you cannot live without it as a Christian. You can't make it in life without the Word of God. I can remember a time in my life and I got saved and, and everything was going wonderfully. I mean, the power of God completely rocked my life. But I reached this point in time a few years later where there was so much stagnation. I was so confused. I didn't know what to do. And I was just basically had no vision, no clue what I was doing. I went to college, dropped out of college, went back to college, was you know working part-time, working full-time, and all these things. But I had no clue what was ahead of me. And I thought, what is wrong with me? <laughs> and I realized that I was asking myself, I'm like, when's the last time I read my Bible? And when you can't remember the last time you read your Bible, that's a problem. Because that sets you up for confusion, sets you up for failure. As a Christian, we need the power of God. We need a constant time in the Word of God. And 
so a couple years ago, something happened to me. I don't know exactly what it is or what changed in my life, but I think it probably had a little bit of something to do with going to Scoan, the Synagogue Church of All Nations, because um, right after we came back, I got this Bible from my sister. And today, the Bible's, you know, it fell apart. So I'm thinking that that should be a good sign. <laughs> it means that something in my life changed. And I noticed a really big change in my life after I made God's word the standard for my life. Waking up every day and taking time in his word, it became such a habit that literally I, I couldn't go without it. If I wouldn't be in the morning, I would crave it so much. I would get off of work and I would go find the nearest Starbucks and I would just read. It became so interesting to me. The more I ate, the hungrier I became, the more that I wanted it, the more that I desired it, the more that I desired more of God. And I saw that difference in my life. I saw that change. And I began to have dreams. I started dreaming of these wonderful things that God could do in my life, whereas before I had no clue. So I want to tell you tonight, if, if you don't know what your vision is, if you don't know what your destiny is, I encourage you, pick up God's word and he will surely show you. He will surely guide you. And if you don't have a dream or a vision, get connected to this vision. Get connected to what God is doing here because you will find yourself on the road to your destiny here. If you keep on investing your time into what God is doing in a place and you invest your effort and your time, God will surely show you what it is that he has planned for you because that is what God wants for you. That's what God has for you. And uh, one thing is that there are two destinies that are planted in our lives. So every single person, you have two destinies. What? You do. You have two destinies. You have one that's planted by God and one that's planted by Satan. Because just as God has a plan for your life, so does the devil. Because the devil wants to use you for his plan and his purpose, which we know is to kill, steal, and destroy but we know that God's plan for you is to bring life in more abundantly, not just for you, but for every person that is affected by you, to bring life in more abundantly. And the destiny that will guide your life depends on which one you water and which one you uproot. I'm going to say that again. The destiny that will guide your life depends on which one you will water, which one that you will care for, which one you will nurture, and which one you will uproot and command out of your life. That will determine which one will guide your life. Either your destiny that's guided by God, or when we don't choose to nurture and take care of that destiny, we automatically choose the destiny planted by Satan. But we, as the people of God, in this church, in this mega vision, we're going to water the seed planted by God in our lives. We're going to uproot the destiny that the devil has tried to use, to use as a part of his plan. And we're going to cast that out of our lives. We're going to follow the plan of God and do great and mighty things for him. I also want to tell you that there is no reality apart from God. I'm going to say that one more time. There is no reality apart from God. You can live this life, but it will be a lie because without God and without the truth, reality is incomplete. Without God, without his truth, reality is incomplete, incomplete because the truth is God. The truth is the word of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1 verse 1 that in the beginning was God, was God and the word was with God and the word was God. That's our savior Jesus Christ. He is the living word of God. So I'm going to say it again that, that those people who make things happen in life simply have good habits. And I want to bring to you the story in the life of my favorite apostle, one that I find myself connecting to so greatly, and that's Apostle Paul. I love Apostle Paul because he was kind of a crazy guy. And I feel like me and him have so much in common because I'm just a little bit crazy too. And Paul... He was a Pharisee, and just like our, our friends here from Teen Challenge uh, said, that Paul was that he was a Pharisee, and he was well-versed in the book of the law. He was well-versed in all that stuff, and he persecuted Christians. He killed Christians. He was a part of, of that whole thing going on. And one day, he's going all about his life, and he he's thinks that he is on track, and all of a sudden, he meets 
with Jesus. He has this encounter on the road to Damascus. He meets with Jesus, and Jesus says, Paul, in fact, his name was Saul at the time. He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he's like, I don't know. (laughs) And he has this encounter with the God of the universe. He has this encounter with Jesus, and his life completely changes. And Jesus gives him this vision. Because remember, his whole life up until this point, he was a dedicated Pharisee. He was dedicated. He believed he was doing the work of God. He believed that he was in the right way. And then all of a sudden, boom, something life-changing happens to him, and he meets with God. He encounters God, and God gives him a vision for his life. God plants within him his destiny. He said, you will preach to the Gentiles. You will bring my message. You persecuted my people before, but now you will suffer very much for me, but you will do great and mighty things for me. You will preach to the Gentiles. And Paul took this in so seriously, because when you meet and you encounter the presence of God Almighty, something inside of you will change. Something inside of you will begin to stir up. Something inside of you will change. How many believe that you will cross the bridge this year into your destiny? Amen. I want you to tell your neighbor, I will cross that bridge. So Paul, he has this encounter with Jesus and then he goes and he does all this great and mighty things and but Paul the interesting thing about his life is he received so much persecution he finally has a dream he finally has a destiny and he feels like I'm going somewhere in life I'm gonna do some awesome things for the Holy Spirit and this is gonna be amazing and the next thing he knows he finds himself in chains the next thing he knows he finds himself in prison and He could have easily just said, well, this is what I get for following God. This is what I get for following his destiny. He could have folded his arms and just said, this is not what I signed up for. You said that I was going to preach to the Gentiles, and it was going to be amazing, and that's what I believe. And here I am in jail with my friend Silas here. We're in jail. He could have done that. He could have easily done that. But he didn't because Paul had really great habits because Paul was well versed in the word of God and he encountered Jesus. And I believe that it's these two things that guided Paul's very life, his very future, because he knew the word of God and he encountered the Holy Spirit. You and I, if we're going to make it in life, if we're going to reach our destiny, we have to develop these two habits in life. We need to know the word of God and we need to encounter the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. Everything that you do today will determine your tomorrow. It will determine the outcome of your future. It will determine which destiny you're going to water and you're going to nurture. And it will determine which one you're going to uproot and throw out of your life. Paul, he had a vision from God. He had a vision given to him directly from Jesus. And he was going to stop at nothing to receive The promise that he was given to fulfill the destiny that God has placed in his life. So when Paul found himself in chains, he didn't gripe, he didn't complain, he didn't murmur, but rather he worshipped God in heaven. When Paul and Silas found themselves in the prison, instead of complaining, they lifted their hands, they got to their knees, and they began to worship God. And you know what happened next? A great earthquake came, and it shook every single prison cell open. It shook the chains right off of their hands, and they were freed from that very prison. Paul had a habit of praising God, even in the worst of his trials, even in the greatest of his circumstances, Paul had developed great habits so that when troubled times came, that he did not lose his faith. He did not allow his circumstances to dictate the direction of his prayer. I mean the direction of his faith. Paul did not allow that to happen because he had amazing habits. He knew the word of God and he encountered the Holy Spirit. And you and I, we need that today. If we're going to see this mega vision come to pass, we need to know God's word. We need to encounter the Holy Spirit. We need to come face to face with the presence of God on a daily basis. It's so important for us as Christians if we're going to make it in life because the vision we have 
the, the plan that God has for us, it cannot be accomplished without the Holy Spirit because it's so impossible. Humanly speaking, just like Jesus said, humanly speaking, what we're asking of God is impossible. But we know that with God, all things are possible. Amen? Do you believe that tonight, church? I can relate so much to Paul because... Maybe just in this season, in this time, I don't know. But I feel like I can relate so much to Paul because every single thing he did contradicted his promise from God. He found himself in chains. He found himself in prison. He was mocked. He was ridiculed. He was falsely accused. Everything bad that could possibly happen, I'm telling you, it happened to Paul. He was even stoned to death. They left him for dead. He was stoned by religious people for saying that I'm going to preach to the Gentiles because that is what God has commissioned me. Everything went against his vision. Everything went against what he believed that God had set in, in his life for himself. Paul quickly found out that the road to his destiny was not a bed of roses. It was not something that was just perfectly lined out by God, perfectly, every single door open, he found that there was some troubles. He found that there was some trials along the road to his destiny. He found that the bridge to his destiny had a few bumps along the way. And that if he was going to make it to the other side, the only way he could make it was that if he kept his eyes focused. Paul kept his eyes focused on the prize. He maintained his focus no matter what was going on around him, no matter if his hands were tied behind his back, no matter if they were throwing stones at him, no matter if he was locked up in prison and held there for many, many months, even years. Paul never allowed his circumstances to dictate the direction of his prayer, the direction of his faith. Paul stayed focused. He looked forward. He kept his eye on the prize because Paul chose to water and to nurture the destiny that God had planted in his life. He wasn't going to allow what the enemy was trying to do to stop him. He wasn't going to allow that to dictate his prayer, to change his confession, to change his faith. Rather, Paul kept his eyes focused on the word. He knew the word of God. He knew that God's word says that I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, that I have overwhelming victory through him, that if God is for me, who dare to stand against me that if God has given me a vision if he's given me a dream if he's given me a purpose if he's given me a mega vision then God will surely see me through amen so Paul found himself in chains and I want to um I want to read a scripture and take my proof text from um, Acts chapter 27 because Paul, during this time, um, as I explained, Paul has an encounter with God Almighty. Everything changes in his life. God plants a vision inside of him. He finds himself in chains. He finds himself in prison. But he had really good habits. And he praised God along the way. And Paul, Paul finds himself in another dilemma. Yet again, another dilemma. And in Acts chapter 27... I'm just going to explain a little bit because it is kind of long. I'm not going to read everything for you. Um, but just to give you a little, a little backtracking here. So Paul finds himself among some religious people yet again. And, and he meets with these religious people and he says, God, that he explained that, I, I, you know, I'm going to do these great things for God and blah, 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 And they were all fine and dandy with everything until he gets to the last part. And he says, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles. And let me tell you, these Jews were not happy with him. <laughs> they said, no, 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 no. We're not okay with that. They throw him in prison. And so Paul has an encounter with these two different governors. Uh, the first one was Felix. The second one was Festus. And so he has these encounters with these governors, and they're listening to him, and they're like, we don't really see anything wrong with, you know, you wanting to preach to the Gentiles. We don't really know what to do. This is all religious, but for some reason, we just want to keep the rest of these Jews happy, so we're just going to keep you in prison because we don't know what else to do. So Felix goes away, and Festus comes, and, and he's kind of like, I don't even know why you're here. I really don't. This is weird, but okay. And then King Agrippa comes along, and... And he's this king, and he comes to pay his respects to Festus. 
And so Festus asked him, he's like, can you take a look at this guy and let me know what you think about him? And, and um, they have this trial with Paul. And as Paul is explaining his, his case to Festus at first, before King Agrippa comes along, Paul says, I appeal to Caesar. Okay. King Agrippa comes along and, and, and listens to his story, and he's like, dude, we can let this guy go. I mean, he hasn't really done anything wrong. He just has this crazy big vision that he thinks he's going to do these really awesome things, and that's really and truly why he's in this prison. And King Agrippa says, I'm ready to release him, except Paul appealed to Caesar foolish. We can look at this and say, you foolish boy, why'd you do this? Why'd you appeal to Caesar? Why'd you do that? I'm just giving you some backtracking here and some of my opinions and thoughts along the way until I realized that why Paul appealed to Caesar? Because Paul had a dream and a vision to go to Rome. He needed to get to Rome because the vision that God had given him was to get to Rome. He's like, I'm going to preach to these Gentiles and I have got to get to Rome. And every single one of his friends is like, you're mental. You're crazy. Why are you going to Rome? We can preach to these people right here. These Jews, they need our help. And Paul's like, I got to preach to the Gentiles. This is what God said. I've got to do it. Years have passed by at this point, and he has not made it to Rome yet. Paul finds himself in prison, and he realizes, sneaky little guy, he realizes, I'm going to appeal to Caesar. Because the moment I appeal to Caesar, that'll take me straight to Rome. He had a great idea. And so right when they're about ready to release him, right when they're about ready to release him of all of his chains, they say, oh, man, (laughs) all right, we're going to send this guy off to Rome then. Unfortunately, um, Paul gets what he wants, but the trip is not so awesome. To get there, it seems like, okay, he's on his way. Everything has now worked up. It's all been worth it. Those chains, all the time in prison, it's been worth it because I am on my way to Rome, just like what God said. Have you ever felt like, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm speaking to myself, and I'm going to be a little bit honest with you here tonight, that this message I'm telling you, I'm actually preaching this to myself right now. Okay, so I really hope that that you guys can connect with this in some way and take a little piece from this. But Paul, he encountered a little problem because it felt like he was on his way. He was there. Here we go. Smooth sailing. It's going to be smooth sailing from here. I'm on my way to Rome. But on on their way to Rome, Paul finds himself in a sticky situation. Life and death, as a matter of fact. So I'm going to start reading here from uh, Acts chapter 27 and verse 10. So are you guys still with me? Do you guys understand where I'm going? I know this is a lot of the word of God. I know it's a lot of backstory, but I promise you I'm going somewhere. I really am. I'm taking you somewhere. So in verse 10, they're on this boat now to Rome, and and the weather is terrible. Everything's going wrong. It's the wrong season, but they just had to get there. and, And he says, men, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And since Fair Havens was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go on to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete, but the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the land and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. So at this point, they're on this, they're in a boat, and they're sailing to Rome, and Paul says, some bad stuff is about to happen to us right now, and the other guys are like, yeah, you're just a prisoner, so we don't really need to listen to you. Paul's like, something bad is about to happen to us right now. There is danger ahead of us. And they're like, this is just a little wind. It's no big deal. And boom, out of nowhere, a big typhoon comes, and they find themselves in the midst of a storm. 
And in verse 18, it continues. It says, the next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even took some of the ship's gear and threw it overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You have avoided all, you would have avoided all this damage and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. And this is exactly why I love Paul. Because they were in this huge storm. It says that the sun and the stars were completely blotted out. It said that they had lost all hope. Paul was supposed to be on the journey to his destiny. Paul was supposed to be crossing that bridge to get exactly where God said that he was supposed to go. But Paul finds himself in a sticky situation. He finds himself in a dark situation. He finds himself in an unfavorable situation situation. But what I love is that Paul found that God was with him. That the people who said, we're not going to listen to you about the storm that's coming. Now all of a sudden they're listening to him because he says that the God in whom I belong to, the God who I serve says, it's going to be okay. He said, you will surely stand trial before Caesar. So through Paul, they have a little teeny tiny bit of hope now. Paul did not allow his circumstances. Paul did not allow the bumps along his bridge to dictate the direction of his prayer. Because he said, I believe, right here he says, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. We will make it. Some things are going to happen. We're going to lose our ship. We're going to get wrecked. But we are going to make it. Amen? Amen. Those people who make it in life, those people who make it across that bridge are the people who have really good habits to know God's word, to experience God so that when you are in the midst of your storm, so that when you are encountering the bumps along the way to cross your bridge into your destiny, that you know that God Almighty is with you, that you will stand firm in the promise and the vision that God has placed into your life. And we as a church will do the same because we have a mega vision, because we're going somewhere, because we have a bridge that we have to cross, because there is a destiny planned within us by God Almighty and surely God will see us through amen do you believe that God will see us through if you believe that I want you to raise your hands and shout unto God Paul quickly found out that the road to his destiny was not a bed of roses but actually I don't know why I shut that let me read to you really quickly, just a little bit more. Sorry, guys, but it's going to be okay. So in verse 39, it says, When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. So they cut off the anchors and left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail, and headed toward shore. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship stuck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officer wanted to spare Paul so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. The others held on to planks and debris from the broken ship, so everyone escaped safely to shore. I'm so excited when I read this because Paul made it. He made it. Paul crossed that bridge in the midst of his worst 
time when he was supposed to die. There was absolutely no reason for this ship to make it across that bridge. Everything possible, all chaos that could have broken loose, it happened while they were on that ship. When it's, it's so easy to think that that bridge that's supposed to cross us to that destiny, it should be easy. We spend our whole lives trying to find the bridge that we think that once we get there, it should be easy, should be smooth sailing from there. But if you will ask Paul, he will tell you, my bridge was not a bed of roses. My bridge to cross over to my destiny. I encountered some problems, the worst problems of his life. In fact, I bet you he was wishing that he was still chained up. I bet you he was wishing that he could only just go back to the time where he was in prison because at least he knew his life was safe because Paul found himself in a life and death situation. But Paul didn't fret. Paul didn't waver in his faith. Paul stood fast. He stood firm upon the foundation of the word of God. And I want to tell you tonight that if you're going to make it in life, you cannot make it unless you have this word. You cannot make it unless you know the word of God. This word of God must be on your lips. It must be what dictates your confession. Paul never confessed doubt. Paul never confessed lack of faith. Paul never confessed murmuring and complaining. Paul only confessed his victory. Paul only confessed that which God had said about his life. He said, I believe my God because an angel of the Lord came and he met me in the time of my need. And he said, Paul, you're going to make it. And what's really good is that if you're one of those people like Paul, then the people around you are going to make it too. Because you know God. Because you encountered God. Because you know this word. Because your confession is that which what God says about your life. If you make your confession the word of God, you will see the plan of God being fulfilled in your life. Your words matter. Your confession matters. Your habits, your experience with God, it matters. Because it will determine the destiny that will guide your life, what you will water and what you will uproot. We've been talking so much in our church and we've been seeing with our own eyes the power of God uprooting the plan of the devil out of people's lives. And we see even from these wonderful testimonies where God uproots addiction, uproots the attack and the plan of the enemy out of our lives so that we can nurture and we can water the plan of God so that we can see the fulfillment of God in our lives. And I want to tell you, I am so happy that Paul didn't give up. I am so, I am here today before you because Paul did not give up because he made it because I can read his testimony and it encourages my own testimony but what's even more awesome is that that my life has been directly affected by Paul making it in life about a year ago I had the privilege to hear how my grandfather got saved my grandpa he grew up being a Mormon his whole family was Mormons and there's nothing wrong with Mormons they're nice people but <clears throat> he grew up and he had some serious dissatisfaction in life. And as he got older, he completely just left the religion. He left the church. He thought, this is, I don't, I can't even do this. And he fell into a lot of things through drinking and he tried drugs and, and all this kind of stuff. And um, he just didn't even believe that there was God anymore. <laughs> Why? Look at his life now. He found himself in alcohol. He found himself in drugs with a, a wife that he had a child with that was a, a marriage that was just up and down. He, they got divorced. All this kind of stuff was happening in his life. And one day somebody gives him a pamphlet. And it was a really long pamphlet because this pamphlet happened to be the Book of Romans. And my grandpa, he was so fed up with life. He had been to church. He had been to a Christian church before. And, 
and he looked at those people and he saw they had their hands raised speaking in tongues, someone getting the demons casted out of them. And he thought, these people are nuts. Is this real? Can this be real? He went his whole life thinking there's no such thing as God. He goes into this church and thought, is that God? I don't know. I don't even know. And he kind of had this sour taste in his mouth. And somebody gives him the book of Romans. And one night, my grandpa, he was so fed up with his life. He was so fed up with the direction that he was going. He takes his book of Romans, and he sits down, he starts reading it. And then he finds that he can't stop. He can't stop reading the book of Romans. And he reads it from start to finish. And at the end of him finishing the book of Romans, took him a few hours, he gets on his knees, and he was so convicted. He said, there has to be a God. He, he lifted his hands in the air, and he said, God, if you are real, you will show yourself to me. He says that in that moment, something like a wave just came over his body and shook him to his core and knocked him to the ground. And he thought it was only like 15 minutes or so. He gets up from the ground and discovers that it's eight hours later that he was underneath the presence of Almighty God. And it was from that moment that my grandpa became a Christian. It was from that moment that my grandfather got saved. He was so rocked by God. He had encountered God in such a strong way that every single person that he encountered after that got saved. My grandma got saved. All of my family members got saved. And today, I am here before you because my grandfather encountered God after reading the book of Romans. If Paul hadn't have made it to Rome. See, Paul wrote the book of Romans he wrote it to them a couple years before he went there, a few months or so before he went there. He said, I'm coming. God said that I'm coming and I'm going to be there. He says it in the first chapter. I'm going to be there. But if Paul never made it in life, then that book wouldn't be in there because it, then it would be a lie because Paul wouldn't have made it to Rome. But he wrote that letter. He said, I'm coming. And you know what? God saw him through. God saw him there. And it was because of that book of Romans that my grandpa heard the word of God. The book of Romans has so much foundation of our faith explaining the word of God. If you don't understand the word of God, read the book of Romans. Read it and you will find out exactly what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. You will find out exactly why you need God, why you should serve God, and how you can serve him to the fullest in your life. And that's exactly what happened for my grandpa. I'm so glad that Paul did not give up on his journey. I'm so glad that when everybody told him, you're not going to make it, you can't do this. You can't preach to the Gentiles. That's not right. That when he found himself in chains, he didn't give up, but he continued to praise God. He continued to lift his hands. He con continued to confess the word of God. And Paul found himself going from danger into his destiny. And it was from that moment on that, that every single book that we read in the Bible, or excuse me, that was a lie, two-thirds of the New Testament that we read is written by Paul because he didn't give up up not once and I want to encourage you tonight that what I see before me is I see a bunch of leaders in here I see a bunch of people who have a dream and maybe maybe you're tired maybe some things in life haven't quite gone the way that you have expected to maybe like Paul that you have reached some storms you've encountered a few blips on the road to your destiny and maybe like Paul, you've discovered that the road to your destiny is not a bed of roses, but you encountered some troubles, some things. But I want to encourage you tonight not to give up because you will find yourself in your destiny if you keep your focus and your eyes on Christ. If you establish those good habits in your life to be able to make it, to have a winning attitude, a winning mindset, and that you will find yourself saying that humanly speaking, my dream is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We will cross that bridge. We will make it to our destiny because we are the people of God and this is our promise. So I want to encourage you tonight, do not give up. Keep on going. If you don't have a dream yet, if you don't have a vision, get connected to our vision and you will soon see the power of God working in your life and he surely will see you through. Amen.